Yikes. Oh my god, dude. I'm still kind of just fucking surprised about the fact that I just fucking made a 55 minute video reacting to an 18 minute video. I don't know how the fuck I did that. I don't know how I did that. But with this one, man, here we got here we got a video from Einzelganga. Something like that. That's how you say, say somewhere around there. And let's read the description for this because I was reading a little bit and I liked it. And I think we're going to be able to transition into this if I do another video after this, which I'm sort of planning to still. Because, I mean, I just I just kind of want to react to things right now. I'm liking these. I like what this is looking up to be. Let me read this real quick. When we look at human condition, we notice that most of us are entirely controlled by a world outside of us. This is true. When we get what we want from it, we're happy. But when it's taken away from us, we're sad. Of course, happiness is a cause and effect, quid pro quo, Matthew McConaughey quotes. Um, um, yeah, the praise people give us uplifts us, but their dislike makes us miserable. Mm -hmm. The more we want something, the more we're willing to sacrifice to get it. And the more we oppose something, the higher the price we're ready to pay to avoid it. Yes. These chains of desire and aversion, love and hate of like and dislike leave us fearful and open to manipulation by shaming and blaming. The appeal of large companies, shaming, open to many places by shaming and blaming the appeal of large companies, political parties, cults, and other external forces that want something from us. And thus the world governs us like a donkey rider with a terror stick, which most of us follow from birth to death, like the obedient cattle we are. But what if we decide to reject the carrot? What if we choose to escape the system? Is that an, is that the reject the carrot the 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 white rabbit Alice in Wonderland? Is that a Alice in Wonderland reference? Which I think well, this is gonna transition good into the next video I want to watch, which is all the mafrings the truth because of this right here. What if we choose to escape the system? Which um, yeah, I know why I say that. Yeah, I know why I say that. Let's go. The word system in the context of this video doesn't refer to a specific political or religious system. It relates to what seems to he misspelt all, it. What brings about a plethora of human behaviors and mental states, like anger and anxiety, namely the very enslavement to the whims of our environment. When we look at the human condition, we notice that most of us are entirely controlled by a world outside of us. When we get what we want from it, we're happy. But when he's it's just gonna say what I just read, us, we're sad. The <laughs> praise people give us uplifts us, but their dislike makes us miserable. The more we want something, the more we're willing to sacrifice to get it. And the more we oppose something, the higher the price we're ready to pay to avoid it. These chains of desire and aversion, love and hate, of like and dislike, leave us fearful and open to manipulation by shaming and blaming the appeal of large companies, political parties. Okay, but you better tell us how we can escape. All right, this is stoic ways to escape. You better tell us. Better tell us why we must escape. How about that? Why must you escape the system? Is it just self-explainable? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, the system does kind of suck. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's not ideal. So I guess that's my reason. That would be my reason to escape. It's just not ideal. Um, but it's also like, look, this one right here. Look, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this before. Before I, I won't pause it that much because I'm. I'm. I, I do it too much. But caring less of our reputation, I love the sound of that. You don't understand how badly I wish that was me. That is so badass. Like, that is badass. That's, you're unstoppable. You're the, it is what it is, right? Those people that genuinely go about their day and their life like that, it is what it is. So unbelievably powerful and unstoppable, man. But it's just like, to what extent can you really do that? To what extent can I believe those words right there? Those words right there. If I, if I believed in words, no, in, in sentences or just like a few words put together, could I believe in that? Could I care completely? Well, he doesn't say completely don't give a fuck about reputation. That is what I notice. But it's also like we're kind of built. I'm sort of pre-programmed. I am sort of like naturally kind of evolved. I am like built, like I said in the beginning, to want to care about my reputation because thousands of years ago, you know, when DNA replicates copies, it takes a very long time and we're moving very fast as a society 
that our genetic shit is not catching up to what we're really doing here. So, I mean, nowadays you wouldn't really die without a tribe. But biologically, not having a strong relationship with somebody, um, not having strong relationships is actually equivalent, apparently, to smoking about five packs of cigarettes a day. Or five cigarettes. I don't think it's packs. I think that's a, that, that sounds a bit crazy. Five. Let's say five cigarettes. It's about equivalent to if you did that for your health. If you're just completely lonely. It's absolutely shitty to your health. And you wouldn't notice. Because it's not that maybe as directly hitting at, like as a, as a cigarette is. To maybe like your lungs. But biologically you're being affected by being lonely. Because you're supposed to yearn to not. You're supposed to want to be in a tribe. It's just like fuck we're advancing so much. But we're not. We're not like our shit just isn't catching up. And I feel like that's going to cause a big problem. But it's also, we're also interconnected. But it's also like, you know, does that really work? We want intimacy and like to really be with people. We're just kind of what we're built for. We're not really built for online friendships. That, but it's just a whole other thing. I do think I am somebody who cares less. But I don't think he's going to ask you. I, he might say to himself, I don't think he's going to ask you or he could ask you. Just completely stop caring because it's just within us. It's just in our genetic code to care. Because thousands of years ago, our ancestors, if they were kicked out of a tribe, that meant they would die. So, of course, the genetic DNA would pick up like, hey, yo, let's not do that. In order to survive, we kind of just need to play along. We need to play nice to the rules that are made in this tribe. We need to believe and be like the people in this tribe and have them like us because that means that we're not going to get kicked out. Um, and that means we'll be able to survive and live longer. And that's all that the genetic DNA really cares about. We're humans. We don't actually just care about living. We care about a whole lot more shit now. Um, we don't just care about survival. Shit's not picking up. That's complicating things, right? Because I don't want to believe that if I'm genuinely lonely, that it's equivalent to smoking five cigarettes. Like, I don't smoke for that reason. I, I want to be healthy, okay? Fuck off, please. It's not very easy to not feel lonely all the time. It's not easy. And of course, I, you know, I have the universe inside of me. I shouldn't feel lonely, but I want to feel not lonely by being with somebody else who also has the universe inside them. Get what I'm saying? Like, you know, there's limits to this shit. I think it's good that people do know, though, you shouldn't care too much. But could you care too little? So we're about to find out. And other external forces. Seven minutes. Oh my god. Us. And thus, the world governs us like a donkey rider with a carrot on a stick, which most of us follow from birth to death, like the obedient cattle we are. But what if we decide to reject the carrot? What mm -hmm. if we choose to escape the system? So the Stoics know how to escape the, the system. The ancient philosophy of Stoicism concerns itself with attaining freedom from the whims of the environment. <laughs> we don't achieve freedom from the system by destroying our surroundings, though, as the external world is not at fault here. The universe does as it does. And yes. even though we have some influence on it, we ultimately cannot command it. Like sunshine, rain and wind strike a farmer's crops, the outside world imposes on us its inescapable conditions. These conditions themselves are not the system. Our enslavement to them is. How come that the waves of fate so quickly sweep us away? How come that even the smallest of misfortunes and tiny bits of luck play our emotions like puppeteers? Stoic philosopher Epictetus explained it as follows, and I quote, Men are disturbed not by things, but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things. Death, for instance, is not terrible, else it would have appeared so to Socrates. But the terror consists in our notion of death that is terrible. When, therefore, we are hindered or destroyed. Okay, but if it's quick, like if I, if I just sleep and never wake up again, which God forbid, but like, if that happened, sure, it's not physically terrible. But like, what if you're out here getting like stabbed to death 32 times? Or like, it's just a slow death. Like, it, like, technically you can call from the moment you're born to the moment you die a slow death. Because of the way we sort of 
conceptualize things. But let's say you're 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 like sick. You got a disease, something. You're in your deathbed. You just want them to pull the plug, or you're being hurt. You're being tortured, stabbed. Right, like you know that shit's gonna hurt. You're not gonna not feel that. But I guess he's just talking. He's not really talking about what leads up to it. He's just talking about okay, not living itself. I mean, yes, like, of course, all we can kind of have is principles and notions about it. That's all we can have about it. Cause I mean, it's just like we don't. We're not alive after that to worry about it. Of course, all we have around death is just the principles and notions, isn't it? I'm not saying that I'm fully scared of it. I'm just saying, like, give me a little more. It's in our notion of death that is terrible. When, therefore, we are hindered or disturbed or grieved, let us never attribute it to others, but to ourselves. That is, to our own principles. End quote. The system works as long as we add fuel to it. The more we see tragedy and blessing in what's natural and beyond our control, the more fortune determines how we feel. Luckily, the Stoics provide us with wisdom to escape the system. These are seven Stoic ideas that might help us replace an extremely vulnerable I need to go back blessing in what's natural and beyond our control. The more fortune determines how we feel blessing in what's natural and beyond our control the more fortune the more we see wait we wait wait you know what i like that the more we see tragedy and blessing in what's natural and beyond our control the more fortune our control, the more fortune determines how determines we how we feel luckily and tragedy. The stoics provide us with wisdom to escape the system these are seven stoic ideas that might help us replace an extremely vulnerable erratic and often stormy mode of living with a tranquil enjoyment of freedom. One, being cheerful. But are you always just gonna feel that freedom? It's ideal, like it sounds great, but you gotta you gotta explain the little shit first. Otherwise, people are just not gonna be willing to listen. They're gonna be like, "You're bullshitting." I'm not just always gonna feel peaceful just because I'm a st uh, I, I I'm into Stoic philosophy. It's not how it works. But like like it's like we live in the entropy world. We live in the wave universe. Shit, it goes up and down. You're never going to always be feeling happy. You're never always going to necessarily be feeling... I think you maybe always should be able to feel a sense of joy and gratification for something. Like, there's there's some things that are, like, weirdly... You might be able to keep some constancy with them. But it's just, like, other things. Like, emotion. Like, who? Man, I don't know. It just seems like... Maybe I'm idealizing stoicism. Because all it is, is just, it's supposed to help you. It's not perfect. It's not like you're going to just feel great all the time. But it's like, it does help. If people have this knowledge and and, and like know this stuff, they're, they're going to get through life a little easier. And that's really just all it's about. It's not about maintaining consecutive, like, unbreakable happiness. It's not going to happen. But it's like, look, you motherfuckers... Y'all are doing, y'all are, y'all are getting angry, which is okay. You know, our emotions do drive our shit, but it's just like, look, this is what you were associating your emotions with. They're like, look, we discovered you don't have to actually associate your shit, this shit with this shit. It's actually not even necessary. That's what they're saying. Okay. Of freedom. One, being cheerful, whatever befalls. Amor Fati. How much time did we waste hoping for good things to happen? and bad things never to appear. How many hours did we weep because the future turned out differently than we had expected? Maybe a little. Humans have become masters in fighting fate and subsequently suffering the inevitable- Yeah, because we idealize things. Why do we idealize things? I don't our know, it's in our evolution. with uncertainty is big business and our fear of misfortune, an opportunity to be exploited. I think that's what we might be here to do. I think it's in our, I think it's, it's our like, we have sort of this collective purpose to make the world an ideal place if we're able to idealize. Like, why do you think we're able to idealize things and think of things as being better? How is that really... Like, of course you should be able to see things for yourself, but it's like, okay, if I'm missing food, should an animal be able to idealize 
having food? Because what does idealizing do? Does that drive you to do those things that you're idealizing? And would it serve a purpose? Because you'd probably be idealizing having more food or having better shelter or being in a bigger tribe or being in a tribe. Is that maybe that maybe that's why we idealize? Hmm. Maybe. But it's also like we idealize everything though. It's just like we idealize systems. It's just like, okay, we can idealize. Let's use this to our advantage. Let's create the ideal world then. What's stopping us? Let's all just come together, create the ideal world. That's what I want to do. Because I want to call to more people to create the ideal world. It's just like, I know I say it all the time. We don't live in an ideal world. But literally nothing is stopping us, bro. I mean, yeah. nothing that, it's not impossible is what I'm saying. <laughs> There's certain things, for sure. It's just not impossible. It's just like. Why are more people, if it's something's not impossible, why are more people pushing for it? What's more important to you, man? What's more important than making the world an ideal place? What is more important? You're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy the world more. There's less suffering. Let's make it more ideal. Come on. Avoid it. Let's think Many of more better systems. For the future, like the illusion of safety, the protection of ourselves and loved ones, the prevention of encountering things we don't like. So, as slaves of our likes and dislikes, we try to trick fate by adjusting our environment to keep misfortune at bay. But we can't put locks on every door of life. We can't police reality's every street and alley. Despite the time, effort and money spent on protective measures, fate always wins. We, therefore, escape the system by accepting whatever comes, instead of paying dearly as a vain attempt to resist the inevitable. Yes. By doing so, we'll less likely let others capitalize on our fears and we'll be less disturbed when misfortune occurs. As Seneca stated, and I quote, I wish to be like Why them. then should we be angry? Why should we lament? <coughs> we are prepared for our fate. Let nature deal as she will with our own bodies. Let us be cheerful whatever befalls and stoutly reflect that it is not anything of our own that perishes. 2. Caring less about reputation. Anything of our own. What if like, regard. what if a loved one dies though? Say like, you know, this shit you gotta explain. I want, I want further explanations. Like, what if a like a loved one dies? God forbid. Like, I'm guessing those shits. You don't really. Maybe you don't need to get into. I mean, I don't. They're not gonna tell you. I doubt. Even somebody like Seneca. I doubt you tell them. Oh, my family member died. I doubt. Even though they generally believe that. I doubt they're going to be like, oh, don't cry, man. Like, there's certain things that, I mean, nobody's going to tell you, like, no, you shouldn't feel sad about this. Like, there are things. But a lot of times, a lot of the things that people are crying about, and I'll tell you this, I've noticed this. Nowadays, a lot of the shit that motherfuckers are really worried about and caring about and crying about and getting all emotional and worked up about, it ain't that serious, bro. It ain't that it's serious. Reputation as a so-called preferred indifferent. It's nice to have, but you don't need it to be happy. Moreover, as is the case with anything external, reputation is ultimately beyond our control. Mm -hmm. Some people spend a lifetime building a good reputation for themselves just to see it destroyed because of a single misstep. Others <laughs> live lives of crime and complete disregard of their social standing, but suddenly gain fame and admiration by chance. Conclusion: Reputation is as fickle as the wind. The more we care about the good standing, the more we become dependent on other people's opinions, which is unreliable. Yes. Over, if we care about the opinions of others, we will be open to manipulation and exploitation, and we become slaves to the environment. Epictetus argued that we should not let our desire for a good reputation stand in the way of our mental well-being. If necessary, we should accept things like shame, blame, our mental well yeah but i uh, it'd be ideal if more people could get into this because if you're going to be the lone wolf who's not caring about the reputation it's gonna it might make it a little bit harder for you to function in society because you're different and if not enough people find it okay for people to be different and understand that people are different and if not enough people know this stuff you're gonna end up a lonely motherfucker even though you're literally like the best motherfucker out there like, you're, like, the smartest motherfucker out there, and for some reason, that's gonna make you lonely. 
because you understand this and other motherfuckers don't. And it's like, is it even worth fucking understanding? Because, I mean, society is so fundamental to all of us. Of course, I want to get along with people. Of course, I want to I want to have great relationships with people. Of course, I want to have a good reputation, but it's just like f to protect myself. I deserve to be able to like for myself. It's not selfish. I mean, technically, everything we do is technically selfish, but it's like it's not selfish in the way that we understand things to be selfish for me to just want to simply take care of myself, man. Like, I can't care so much about your reputation. I'm not going to let you. It's like that. I love you, but fuck you thing that Gary Vee was talking about. And my fuck you is not a bad fuck you. It's just like I'm not willing to live life off of off of your ideals and and thoughts and ideologies and opinions and formulated thoughts and concepts about what life should be. I live off my own shit. I don't live off your shit. Like, look. Fuck. How? We need more people to know this. Because then it might make it harder for you. If you generally don't care, it might make it hard for you to make friends if you're, like, the smartest stoic out here. Wouldn't it? They're going to think you're weird if you're out here not crying if your mother dies. But that's a, that's a extreme example. This one's the concerning one. It's like, yes, I like that. But it's like... I don't know, man. Letting go of people? Oof. I mean, it's all right. It's all about your like the Stoics know, man. This is the ideal way to take care of yourself. Ideal. But it's like nothing is perfect. What complications does this have? I don't know. Well being, if necessary. What if it doesn't? We should accept I don't know, I just feel like it has complications. I can't think of them right now. Maybe just for this one. What else? Choosing a response. That's good. You should always do that. This might have a complication. That might have a complication of death. But it's also like, I'm, I'm personally fine with that one because, uh, not death, but like believing in this or acknowledging that and, you know, accepting. Because like, I understand to live is to risk things, bro. If you're not risking things, you're not truly living. You're not living. You're just not. You gotta risk things. Otherwise, you're living a life of regret and passiveness, and it's just like, dude, that's boring. I don't even give a fuck about making it to 100 if I'm not taking risks. If I'm not going after what I want. If you want something, you go and fucking get it. That's what living is about, right? You already put on this world. Why not risk it all? Why not go after those things that you really want? What better things do you have to do anyway? Live to a hundred with a life that is not the one that you are capable, that is not the greatest life you are capable of living. That is not filled with all those things that you, that you know you'd love and would make life easier for you. And, you know, like, bro, you got to take risks. Man. You got to take risks. Things like shame, blame, way of our mental well-being. If necessary, we should accept things like shame, blame, exclusion, and ridicule if that allows us to purchase tranquility and freedom. The latter are within our control and therefore uncontrolled by and independent of what other people think or say. 3. Learning to endure Most of the time, when we're in an undesirable situation, we wish to escape it quickly. But this isn't always possible, and so we go on to complain and moan and feel bad about it as we believe we're entitled to a better position. But we're ultimately not entitled to anything. Yes. And many times, the best way to handle a situation but you have a reason is to, want to endure it. How often have not we deviated from our path, have betrayed things go our wrong. morals, compromised our values, simply because we didn't want to endure pain? Pain is the mighty weapon that makes good people do bad things or refraining from doing good things. Pain then remains a tool for control and in our attempt to run from it, we run straight into the trap of those trying to control us. Thus, we're willing to exchange our freedom for a little less pain and discomfort. If we find it challenging to endure painful situations, we might want to turn to Marcus Aurelius. His meditations teach us that endurance isn't necessarily bad. Endurance can be a purpose, something beneficial to us.
even if its consequence is death. I quote, Everything that happens is either endurable or not. If it's endurable, then endure it. Stop complaining. If it's unendurable, <laughs> then stop complaining. Your destruction will mean its end as well. Just remember, you can endure anything your mind can make endurable by treating it as in your interest to do so, in your interest or in your nature. Mm. End quote. We could compare this approach to Albert Camus' interpretation of the Greek mythological figure Sisyphus. The gods sentenced Sisyphus to push a rock uphill for eternity. His only path to liberation was to fully enjoy his fate, so that his punishment ceased to be a punishment. 4. Letting go of people. Punishment ceased to be a punishment. I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. If I was Sisyphus, I'd be pissed. Then again, I'm not Sisyphus. Maybe Sisyphus is just better than me. It's like, yeah, that's the ultimate revenge. That might make them feel stupid. But it's just like, bro, this is your life now. This is your life now. You're pushing a rock up a hill, whether... You know, I mean, they didn't, like, get one over you. They don't have, like bragging rights like you're a strong wit like strong-willed motherfucker you have endurance but it's like you're pushing a rock is that for the rest of your life like you're just pushing a rock bro like do you sleep are you allowed to do anything until you've made it up the hill it's just like do you have sex do you eat like these motherfuckers are going home and getting laid like, cool. You might as well. And like, if this situation has to happen to you. Yes. If you can do it. Do it. If you can believe that your punishment is not a punishment. And, you know. Life, I wouldn't say it's a punishment. But some people have been born into some seriously, like, shitty situations. Compared to other people's situations. It's shitty situations. And it's just like. If they could see it as not a punishment. They should, hundred percent, because then they can get a, they can stop at least feeling sorry for themselves and stop feeling entitled to something, even if it, even if relative to other people they might suffer a little more, they might be a little bit more stressed. I don't know. That's a good one. Learning to endure punishment. Four, letting go of people. Ooh. Strong attachments to people can have devastating consequences. I have an attachment. The possibility of losing. I have a very unique attachment thing. Our lives to the point that our every move is a desperate attempt. Begins to dictate our lives to the point that our every move is a desperate attempt to avoid an unavoidable endgame. The separation between ourselves and the person we're attached to. The love story between Padme and Anakin in the Star Wars prequels beautifully displays the danger of unhealthy attachments and how this welcomes dark forces to manipulate and enslave us. Palpatine uses Anakin's fear of losing Padme to control him with all the horrible consequences. Oh. If Anakin had been able to... No! Why am I like... Why am I just questioning it? I consider myself a stoic, but it's just like... I feel like I'm questioning a lot of this. It's like, I, I'm overthinking this fucking video a lot. It's like, I'm going into the extremes because I can always think of an extreme situation. It's like, I like to have something that's foolproof. But it's not about, this is not about being foolproof. I'm tripping. I'm just overthinking it. But it's just like, what if you're willing to suffer though? Like, oh, I don't know. Because sometimes you just really want to love somebody. I can't explain it, man. What? You know, you're telling me I'm not supposed to get so... I mean, yes, I'd suffer less if I lost a person. I get it. I think I'd suffer less if I was with the person too, though, wouldn't I? Because it's not like you suffer less if you're more attached to the person. You just do love them more, I'd say. And you maybe love their presence more, so you'd maybe enjoy it more if you were more attached. 
Because I feel like I get attached quickly to people. Um, especially if I like them. If it's a girl, right? And I like you. I might get attached. Doesn't always happen. But if I do, I could get attached really fast. Um, and it's happened recently. Um, but it's just like, yes, Darth Vader could use your love against you. If you do lose her, you're going to be fucking bummed out for like God knows how long. But it's like, how are you going to let that stop you? What is he going to say? Let's see what he has to say. Let me let him finish. L let him finish, Luis. Fuck. Using Padme to control him with all the horrible consequences. If okay. Anakin had been able to love, not in a way that's suffocating, fearful, and possessive, but rather mm. based on freedom, trust, and detachment, detachment, the dark side would have been powerless over him. Epictetus gives us some harsh but side and possessive. Let me try to conceptualize that. You're supposed to love in a way that's not suffocating you or her or both. Not fearful. Fearful of losing the person? And possessive, like, oh, I must have this. Urgh. Easier said than done for that last one. Because it's just like, if you like want something, of course you're not going to want to lose it. I think possessive is just a weird concept of a word. It's just like, I don't like, of course you're not going to want to lose it, man. Why would you want to lose that? What's, what's unpossessive mean though? Like, is it just like, that means like trying too hard? Is that what that means to keep something harder than you should ever go? Cause if you try too hard at that point, you're not, you're never going to win. You're never gonna get keep the girl if you're possessive, like overly possessive. But it's like you don't want to lose based people. on freedom, trust, and detachment. The and how can you have it on freedom, trust, and detachment over him? Trust, okay. This gives us some harsh but potent advice regarding the attachments to things we're fond of, which is that we ought to see them as they are, as destined to be broken or dead. I quote: If, for example. You are fond of a specific ceramic cup. Remind yourself that it's only ceramic cups in general of which you are fond. Then, if it breaks, you will not be disturbed. If you kiss your child or your wife, say that you only kiss things which are human. And thus, you will not be disturbed if either of them... Oh, are no, 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 no. He went to the extreme. Fond, then, if it breaks, you will not be disturbed. If you kiss your child or... Mm, I don't like that. I don't like that. For some reason, I don't like that. Maybe I'm not selfish enough. Maybe I want to care about people. You got to explain that. I think he's going to explain it further for that last one. The, the stamp on this doesn't have much time left. What the fuck? <laughs> The fuck, my fucking bumblebee. The fuck did you fall over for? What else fell? Oh shit. That was funny. Anyway, he went to the fucking extreme. If you kiss your child or your wife, say that you only kiss things which are human. Okay, but they're special humans. I don't just kiss any human. These are things that, of course, I've. You know, it's a concept. I have given this. Thing. It's not like they're de they're made for me. It's not like they're destined to, they, I mean, well, I mean, my kid is my kid, though. Your kid is your kid, though. Your child is your child. You're, you kind of have, like, this natural, like, connection to them. Thus, you will not be just, no, no, don't say it like that. That can't be what he wrote. There's no way somebody would say that, but that, this seems like bullshit. I'm not going to hold you. And say that I only kiss things which are human? Why would I do that? I don't even care. Why the fuck would I do that? That just makes you so detached. This is this is how motherfuckers... I think more people are into stoicism than I thought. And they take it very serious. Because this sounds like a lot of motherfuckers nowadays. They just don't care about anything. It's just like, yeah. You might be less stressed than me. But it's just like, bro, I kind of see you as a bitch. But you wouldn't care about that either. Ooh, damn. She wouldn't care about that either. Because of this. Caring less about reputation. So then it's what I said. If somebody, it might be problematic if you're not crying over your fucking son and wife crying. I mean, dying 
right? It might be problematic if motherfuckers don't see you crying. They're going to be like, bro, what the fuck wrong with you? But then you're not going to care because of this. Because you care less about your reputation and you endure pain. And you accept fate. Letting go of material things doesn't apply for your wife or kid. You choose your response and you accept death. Damn. It's a whole lot of acceptance, dude. Like, you need to, like, fucking, oh my god. You, you can't just flip a switch. This takes a process. You can't just flip a switch and be like, okay, I'm kissing my wife this morning. But I'm going to tell myself in my head, I'm only kissing a human. And I'm only, I only like humans. Maybe not my wife necessarily. Maybe not just her. Maybe I do like her specially. But see, I just kiss humans. I kiss things which are human. So if I lose them, I will not be disturbed. I don't know. Should you do that? Should you though? Doesn't matter if you could. Should you do that? That's a question on it. That's a different. Your wife say that you only kiss things which are human and thus you will not be disturbed if either of them dies. 5. Letting go of material things. There's Insane. a reason why people are stuck on the hamster wheel of this one's easier hours to work a job they hate, being told <laughs> what to do day in day out, often <laughs> to exhaustion. We're willing to sacrifice our precious time and energy to purchase material <coughs> Society tells us that happiness is <coughs> as it depends on all kinds of outside circumstances. We need that minimum amount of money, social status, that group of friends, that house in the suburbs. And as long as we don't have it, we are not happy. But even though attaining say that's for the many, are these status, things bro. worthy of pursuing? They are, above all. Part of the domain where fate and fortune rule. Hence, they'll kick and throw us around like a child's toy, simply because we choose to wrestle with those we can never beat. In his letter to Lucilius, titled On True and False Riches, Damn, I have a lot to go about. Sto I'm not a, as much a stoic as I thought I was. These people are ahead of. These people are different. Oh my god, these people are different. Why am I just now realizing that these people are fucking different? This is almost like these motherfuckers kind of remind me of Robert Greene. This is 48 Laws of Power type shit. This is like low key amoral as fuck. It's just like, damn. And I'm used to being moral. I'm used to caring. And a lot of this is sort of amoral. Material shit don't really matter. This is fine. More people should do this. This one's easy. This was the easiest one out of all of these. Probably. Maybe. Maybe not. But. Value wow. of all these material possessions we pursue, like gilded couches. Gilded couches. Jeweled furniture. Jeweled is furniture? Really make us happy? Or is it to show the world that we're living the good life? It's to show the world. Seneca goes as far as to say that we should not let our happiness rely on anything outside of ourselves. <coughs> from riches like gold and silver to even the most simple things like water and porridge. Doing so makes us independent of any external circumstance, no matter how trivial. Seneca argues that not a person over whom fortune has slight power, but a person over whom she has no power at all enjoys true freedom. He then refers to the words of his teacher Attalus, and I quote, if you are willing to think often of these things, you will strive not to seem happy, but to be happy. And in addition, to seem happy to yourself rather than to others. Six, choosing our response. A typical okay. reaction to people that provoke, insult, or in any way try to offend us is to answer with anger and hostility. Thus. The system gives other people the power to make us feel bad as we let their behavior affect the way we act. But then, as with the quest for a good reputation, we tie our happiness to other people's actions. Jerks, toxic people, 
narcissists, psychopaths. These people roam the world like rain clouds, showering us with our malice, hoping that we'll suffer their wrath. But there's a choice. Or, as Viktor Frankl wrote, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Do we respond to these people with anger, fear and hostility? Then we have handed them... Okay, but you're not taking psychology into... into you're not taking psychology into the, into the question here. You're kind of ignoring psychology. Wherein you're actually supposed to express emotions because if you don't, they're not going to go away. They're just going to build up. So I think you got to express anger just in a healthy way. You don't got to go beating people up. But I think you should express anger in a way that's like anger is there to put limits on things that are passing their limit. You know, they're going they're crossing the line. So it's like, hey, I'm going to get you back to fuck up real quick. You're you're way out of pocket. You're out of hand here. Um. But, I mean, who the fuck knows what the right response for a lot of shit can be in a lot of situations, right? I'd say just don't go, like, over the top. You should know. Like, don't go beating people up because they said something mean to you, right? You're just going to punch them. They're going to sue you. There's nobody wins. Um, You're going to get into a bar fight. You're going to get a broken nose. Fines might be thrown around the place. You lose. Everybody loses. <clears throat> But it's like how how can you go? You have to you have to express it though. You have to express something like anger. Hostility is 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 a different thing. But anger is an emotion. You gotta express an emotion, just in a healthy way. And I don't know how to do that. If like let's say a jerk is saying some shit to you, should you respond right away? I think maybe you should, in a healthy way. Maybe you don't have to insult them back, but you can be like, hey man. You're crossing the fucking line. I'm the key to our emotional faculties. But if we choose to be indifferent to them, they will only pollute the space around us, but not our hearts and minds. And thus, they will not affect our freedom and our inner tranquility. Man, but the they're connected. Is that we're Man, only... they're connected to... The Stoics are not Buddhists. We're connected to the shit around us, man. It's like, just get away from people like that. That's the real answer to that. We're connected to our environment. So if they're polluting our environment, what the fuck do you think that's going to do to us? That's, that's, you fucked up with that one. He, he's, no, he does not know what he's talking about with that last one. Slaves, if we choose to be, or don't realize that we have a choice to be free. Seven, accepting death. Some people claim that the root of all fears is the fear of death. As is the case with the fear of pain, the fear of death can also dictate the way we live. The Stoics would argue that a virtuous life is much more important than a long life. Yes, we don't have I believe anything that. to say about the latter, but we do have everything to say about the former <coughs> as long as we're alive. If we fear death, we may end up living to avoid it rather than living for life itself yes. and making it great. Yes. When we live life to avoid death, we continually escape circumstances that contain the slightest threat and seek out circumstances that show us an illusion <coughs> of safety. Yes. We become anxious sheep who follow any shepherd that promises us the light of another day. But no shepherd can save us from the inevitable consequence of life the disintegration of what we deem ourselves and the return of our physical bodies to nature. It's futile to fear death, or worse, it's dangerous, as the fear of death might stop us from living bravely and that virtuously. But death, so argues Marcus Aurelius, is too one of the things required by nature, like growth, maturity, the first gray hair. Everything comes and goes into no, we're existence, just here to passes experience. away. I quote, So this is how a thoughtful person should await death, not with indifference, not with impatience, not with disdain, but simply viewing it as one of the things that happen to us. Now you anticipate the child's emergence from its mother's womb. That's how you should await the hour when your soul will emerge from its compartment. Thank you for watching.
That was beautiful. That was beautiful. I like that. <laughs> well, seven stoic ways to escape. 45 minutes. Jesus Christ. Oh my god, are these fuckers on Apex, bro? I was really just watching this because motherfuckers aren't getting on Apex, man. Apex? You want? Okay, guys. I'm on my phone. Anyways, thank you for watching. That was seven stuck ways to escape the chains of the world. Some of that was a more amoral. This one, mm. it's amoral, but it's it's for you. That's for you, man. For you. You do this, especially that last quote. It it didn't it didn't sit too right with me, but I can't hate on it. You know, what the fuck. Anyway, see you on the next one.